the IMF is seeing 70 countries as potentially the next Sri Lankas out there, and we really have to act and act urgently. If the global economy has seen four major debt waves since the 1970s. There was a Latin American debt crisis of the 1980s, the Asian financial crisis of the late 90s, and the global financial crisis starting in 2007. All of these were periods where countries accumulate a lot of debt really fast. Each of these debt waves ended when there were big economic shocks, culminating in widespread economic meltdown. Some experts say we are in a fourth debt wave now. About 60% of uh, low-income countries are either in debt distress or at high risk of debt distress. The World Bank has sounded the alarm that there are about 70 countries that need debt treatment. This number is a record high. 2008年的次贷危機呢,它是一次大浪,它有可能會大浪在沿海的很多大廈。換句話說,這一次的債務的浪潮對人類的經濟的衝擊啊,如果一旦爆發的話,會遠遠超過 the cracks are showing. Seven million Sri Lankans are currently living in poverty. That's a third of the population. It's been every year since anger spilled onto the streets after Sri Lanka ran out of money. At one point, our debt servicing was 100% of our revenue. Analysts believe Islamabad, with more than $121 billion in external debt, is heading in the same direction as Colombo. The biggest elephant in the room is the debt stress. Pakistan is spending more than 50% of our budget on debt servicing. And in Egypt, an economy dependent on tourism was hammered by the triple punch of COVID-19, soaring food and energy prices. By December 2022, it required a $3 billion IMF package to stay afloat. In March 2023, it was reported that many more Egyptians now have to turn to food banks for help. In Lebanon, hundreds of protesters tried to break through the fence leading to the government headquarters. The country is in the grip of the worst economic and financial crisis in its modern history with a serious debt problem. In Southeast Asia, the World Bank says that Laos is being weighed down by the need to service large external debts, amounting to 89% of GDP in 2022. Governments are paying more in debt repayments than they are able to um, invest in essential public services like healthcare and education and to fight the climate emergency. When people can't access decent health care, when they can't access decent education, it affects them both today, but also affects their longer term prospects and collectively affects the prospects of a whole economies. If you're spending 60 cents of every dollar on servicing debts, you have to make trade-offs. And a lot of countries right now, according to the United Nations, there are 48 countries representing 3.3 billion people that are spending more money on debt service than they are on education or health care. That is immense. How did the world get here? To understand the origins, let's wind back the clock to 2008. After the financial crisis, interest rates were very low to encourage people to borrow and make investments. But when interest rates are really low in the global north, uh, that pushes credit, because it's cheap, into emerging market and developing countries. Of course, they, they were able to borrow at, at very low rates. And most emerging market and developing countries boomed from that. Private creditors also expanded their lending in developing countries to take advantage of higher interest rates. 
The private creditors are essentially banks, hedge funds, investors. So for example, BlackRock is one of the biggest lenders to lower income countries and banks like UBS and HSBC. So all the, the banks that kind of buy up and trade bonds in lower income countries, they hold a lot of the, the debts from lower income countries. And then there was China's Belt and Road Initiative. Over a trillion dollars borrowed from Chinese banks was spent all over the world on highways, railways, ports, government buildings, dams and power generation plants. But right before COVID, some experts sounded the alarm that this spate of borrowing from China, from private lenders and from multilateral lenders was adding up to more than countries can afford to pay. And then COVID hit. Governments needed billions of dollars to fight the disease. Economies slowed. Russia invaded Ukraine, pushing up the prices of oil, fertilizers, and wheat, leading to skyrocketing inflation across the world. Then there were climate shocks, destroying crops and requiring emergency funds from governments to deal with those crises. Pakistan's economy suffered another blow in 2022 when floods submerged a third of the country. Pakistan should have gone through a process for some level of debt restructuring and debt cancellation. But instead, what happened is the IMF decided, as it normally does, is to lend it more money with strings attached around austerity measures. And so what's happened is that Pakistan is now more indebted than it was last year. And the straw that has broken the camel's back is the high interest rates that countries now have to pay for the loans they took when interest rates were low. COVID, war in Ukraine, climate change, interest rate hikes, globalization of inflation from the uh, advanced economies, that, uh, you know, some countries could handle the first couple strikes, but uh, we're past three strikes for so many countries, and that's why the IMF is seeing 70 countries as potentially the next Sri Lankas out there, and we really have to act and act urgently. Dinshadashawa 也非常的严重，所以应该说全球的债务危机啊，到了历史上啊都没有出现过的这样的一个啊非常艰难的时刻，化解债务危机成了现在防止全球经济危机爆发的一个必不可少的手段。How much of Sri Lanka's debt servicing went to its biggest bilateral creditor, China? We'll have the inside story on the port that sparked accusations about debt trap diplomacy.